pleasure now to introduce Dr. Gretchen Schwarzy. Uh, Gretchen's an associate professor uh, of surgery at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she is the holder of the Morgridge Professorship in Vascular Surgery. Um, Gretchen's nationally recognized expert in surgical decision making with a focus on improving communication between older patients and their surgeons. And she has a particular interest in aiding patients and doctors in making medical decisions which support patient preferences, values, and goals. About 10 days ago, Gretchen gave the very prestigious John J. Conley lecture in ethics, uh, I'm sorry, in philosophy and medicine at the American College of Surgeons Clinical Congress. And uh, it was outstanding. Uh, and I think anyone who was there uh, knows uh, what a wonderful speaker she is. So it's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Gretchen back. Thanks, Peter. OK, hopefully the acoustics are all right here. Give me two seconds. All right, so um, wow, this is a tough group. That was a really extraordinary presentation by Alex. I haven't seen anybody tease out um, the realities of the um, collaboration that happens in the operating room, so it was brilliant. Um, I'd like to both uh, acknowledge my funders and express my uh, um, frustration with my husband who has invested tons of our money in this Meslite business with absolutely no return, but somehow it, it needs to be on my disclosure slide. <laughs> And, um, you know, in the Schwarzy lab, we have three rules. And the first rule is study what pisses you off. The second rule is follow the data. And the third rule is don't piss off the surgeons. So today I'm going to talk about some, um, some work that actually began here many, many years ago uh, after a question that Rochelle Benaki uh, asked at the end of one of my talks. And it really goes along the lines of this issue of follow the data. And Rochelle stood up at the end of a talk, and I honestly don't even remember what I was talking about at this point, but she said, Gretchen, why is it so hard for surgeons to withdraw life-sustaining treatments on their post-operative patients? Is it just because of their outcomes and their more mortality statistics, or is there something else going on? I was like, wow, that's a really interesting question because it seems like it has an obvious answer, but it doesn't really ring true. And while I'm not going to talk about surgical buy-in and all the other stuff that followed afterwards, I am going to talk about what we did subsequent to our exploration of surgical buy-in, which is that we started audio recording conversations between surgeons and patients because surgeons had told me that they had made a contract with patients, that when we talked to patients about surgery, it wasn't just about surgery, but all the other stuff that came afterwards and they had agreed to it. And I was like, huh, I'm a surgeon. I don't really do that. What are we doing? And so when we started putting audio recorders in the surgical clinic, trying to listen to these preoperative conversations, we came up with some really interesting data. And indeed, surgeons don't really make this contractual plan with patients. But on top of that, after we uh, it listened to these conversations, we interviewed patients both before and after their operation. And we found that patients had very different impressions of what was going on in these conversations as well. And when we talked to them, they said things like this. When I went and talked to the surgeon, I felt that surgery had to be done. There really was no choice. We did it by and large because he said, well, it needed to be done, and there weren't any other options. They also noted that the recovery was much harder than they had anticipated, and that even though the surgeon had disclosed multiple disarticulated risks of the operation, they were pretty shocked that, that the recovery of surgery was so challenging. And then finally, they were very clear that there was never an opportunity to talk about what would happen if things went poorly. That especially in cases where we did interview family members for patients who had very severe complications, including death, they really didn't know what to do after surgery because it had never been addressed before surgery. And this is what this data looks like. This is a neurosurgeon in one of our earliest studies. And he's talking to a patient about tumor resection. And very appropriately, he goes through all the risks of surgery. And I would say he does everything that we've been taught. What questions do you have for me? And the patient would say, well, washing my hair. And the doctor very appropriately says, well, you can use shampoo, but don't scrub the stitches. And the family's like, oh, are you going to use stitches as staples? 
And what we noticed when we th saw these pa questions that patients were asking is that they wanted to ask questions, but they weren't quite sure what to ask. And in my lab, this gets coded as logistic and technical concerns. That while these questions may seem really important in the moment, they actually don't help patients figure out what are the options, what's it like to have surgery, and what's the recovery going to be like, and what would happen if things went poorly. How might you know my wishes? So we sat down with a group of patients and families and for over a year went through all of these transcripts looking at the patient-doctor conversation. And what we came up with was an intervention that's called a question prompt list. It's pretty simple, it's a brochure, it's a little trifle brochure. And you can see that the brochure has three elements. The first element is really this issue of options. And it's not just what are my options, but what is surgery gonna do for me? In your opinion, do you think surgery will help me live longer? In your opinion, do you think surgery would help me feel better? The kinds of questions you might wanna ask your surgeon in order to figure out if surgery is right for you. The middle panel is really about what to expect. Right? These are expe expectations when things go as well as we could hope for. Am I going to need lines or drains? Is this going to change my other health problems? What kind of care am I going to need after surgery? And then the last panel is really about advanced care planning. What, how will you know my wishes if I can't speak for myself after surgery? So, um, so we applied to the government, and they gave us a ridiculous amount of money to study a paper brochure. And um, this is our conceptual model of what we were trying to do here. The idea of our intervention is that prior to surgical visitation outpatient, we would have the surgeon send the patient and their family a letter. And the first is a letter from the surgeon saying, surgery's hard, and when you come to see me, I want you to ask questions. And here's a list of questions you might ask. And we included the brochure. And the idea in the literature is really this idea of patient activation. When you prepare patients for decision making, they may have a better time. So our primary outcome of our study was what questions do they ask? Do we change the questions from these ideas of logistic and technical concerns about stitches and staples and shampoo to questions about should I have surgery? What should I expect if everything goes well? We also had some other outcomes, including surveys of patients and family members after they met with a surgeon, um, which are really sort of how self-efficacious do you feel in your patient-doctor relationship. And then finally, we used a measure of uh, shared decision-making, which is observer-measured, meaning that we audio-recorded all of the conversations from patients in our study and then used this observer-measure of shared decision-making to calculate whether we improve shared decision-making. So we did a multi-site randomized clinical trial using something called a step wedge design and if anybody wants to talk about a step wedge design I'm more than happy to do it with several vodkas in hand it's really a very painful way to run a study but the idea is that you randomize surgeons over time to when they're going to take on the intervention so every surgeon is in a pre post study but their pre section is going to be a little bit different than their post section dependent on your randomization pattern so we did this at five sites across the country Oregon San Francisco Wisconsin in Boston and uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. And we had 40 patients, uh, in, or sorry, 40 surgeons enroll in our study. And they all performed high risk surgery. So neurosurgeons, um, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, uh, cancer surgeons, colorectal surgeons, GYN oncology, and urology. And the patients had in our, we enrolled in our study had to be at least 60 years of age and have one or more comorbidities. And I'm just gonna give you a little spoiler alert. It's a totally negative study, which um, now I need a support group for people doing interventional studies. Um, but it's really sort of um, very interesting to look at the data. So when we looked at these questions that people were asking, we we did see some movement in the questions with our intervention, so I'm going to go just talk about this first outcome of question asking. So when we looked at options questions, you might note the, um, the light gray bar is the intervention group, the dark gray bar is the control group, and that we were able to very gently um, move the um, numbers of questions asked, um, reducing the zeros and increasing uh, the two plus. You'll also note that some of the p-values I'm gonna show you look statistically significant, but they're not. And again, um, this death by math thing is really very frustrating when you run a study. If you study multiple outcomes, you have to use a Bonferroni correction, which reduces your um, 
uh, p-value to the point where we did not see statistical significance. But I think what's most interesting as I run you through these questions that people ask, these are expectation questions, is how many patients didn't ask any questions about what to expect after surgery or what options they might um, have besides surgery. And here's the issue about risks. Very few ask questions about risks at all. So even though this was a really frustrating study, one of the best things about the study is that we um, audio recorded all of these preoperative conversations, and then we have real information about what occurs since we enrolled 450 patients into our study. Um, this is our issue of shared decision making. So this option five score is a, a score invented by Glenn Elwin and, uh, at Dartmouth, and it's a nice way to try to dis, uh, discern whether shared decision making is occurring. We did see some movement in this score. Um, I'm not sure how great six points is. Again, the Bonferroni correction makes this non-significant, but it's interesting this idea of thinking about what are the domains of shared decision making and how white might we measure it? Because when you survey patients and and clinicians after encounter about shared decision making, you get very different results than you do when you actually count up the domains of shared decision making and see if there's a real difference in, um, uh, in the moment. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about the question prompt list and then talk about the exciting data we found uh, with all these audio recordings. So is this enough to uh, consider routine use of the QPL? So it's pretty low risk, it's very low cost, and we found that it didn't change the visit length. It's really just a piece of paper. But I think the most important thing that we found is that questions about options, expectations, and risks are not often asked. And you might note that I didn't even show you the advanced care planning data, and that's because we saw only 13 questions about advanced care planning in an entire study of 450 old people considering major surgery with multiple comorbidities. So that is a huge problem to not think about advanced care planning at all in these conversations. Um, I'm not sure QPL is going to uh, solve that problem, but clearly it's a big issue. Um, the surgeons in our study, we sent out 6,000 of these QPLs prior to the clinical visit, so um, we didn't know who would be enrolled, so we sent it to all of the surgeons' patients, and the surgeons really liked it. They really wanted to continue using it even after, study, after the study, and maybe we'd made some movement on shared decision making. So what else did we find? Um, we found that there was huge variability in the use of shared decision making in our cohort. In fact, there are really some high performers in this surgical cohort by surgeons who really do actually spend quite a bit of their effort in the preoperative conversation doing shared decision making. And then there's a very clear group of low performers. Remarkably, the surgeons, the high performing surgeons, have great variability in their use of shared decision making, and they seem to employ it selectively, either when there's real clinical equipoise for something like a urostomy versus an ileal loop conduit. There's clear notions about patient preferences around those kinds of uh, operations. Or when patients were very, very high risk and they were worried that the outcomes of surgery were suboptimal. The other thing we found is that the patterns of preoperative communication are incredibly robust. And I think all of us do this incredibly consistently, that we start with this explanatory phase where we talk to patients about their disease and we talk about their treatment. We say things like, here, this is you, slice like bread. This is you in a CAT scan. And this is your liver. And this white spot in your liver is a tumor. And then we say, and I'm gonna take it out. And I think that the way we've been taught to describe surgery and its consequences and to get informed consent very much revolves around this notion of generating patient understanding of their disease and the treatment. And the problem with that is that we use a lot of fix-it language about what the problem is and how we might repair it. As a vascular surgeon, you might imagine I say, here, here's your blockage, and I'm gonna do a bypass and go around it. We use this language again and again and again, and then we step back in the second half of the conversation and we say things like, this might not be the right problem to fix, or maybe it's too broken to fix, or I can fix it, but you're never gonna be the same because once your stomach is turned into your esophagus, you're never gonna be able to lie flat. And I wonder if we're not setting people up for real harms because it's very challenging to think through that deliberative part of the conversation once I've told you this is the problem and this is the operation I have to fix it. 
On top of it, the other thing we saw in our data is something that looks much like this. And I'm just gonna put it out there that we had a competition to find uh, the worst case of this, and maybe this one won. Um, but this is actually pretty typical of our data, is that the surgeon does this fairly long monologue trying to describe to the patient what is gonna happen with surgery. And it gets a little bit to this point about transparency and what do people need. But this is a surgeon who is working really, really hard to describe a Whipple operation, which is a removal of a pancreas cancer. And he's going on and on and on talking about how this is just like plumbing, and and now I'm going to describe the plumbing to you, what I'm gonna sew back together, and where's the gastrojejunostomy. And at the end, he says, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you can die. I am not sure how patients can use this type of information in order to figure out whether surgery is right for them. It's as if the plumber came to your house to fix your toilet, and the plumber spent tons of time explaining all the little gizmos and the things in the back of it, and what were broken, and what he was gonna do in order to fix your toilet, and never told you you, how well your toilet was going to work afterwards, how long it was going to last, and what it was going to cost you. Because at the end of the day, as much as I can imagine some people want to understand how their toilet works, not everybody wants to know how their toilet works, but everybody needs to know how much is it going to cost, how long is it going to last, and how well is it going to work. And if we spend most of the preoperative conversation doing stuff like this and forget to do that other stuff, we've really misled patients. And so when we went through our data and we looked at how often surgeons talked about the goals of surgery, what was the aim of the targeted objective of the operation, we found that over 50% of the time in these preoperative conversations, the only goal mentioned was to fix the problem. And the problem with this is that if you tell patients that this surgery is gonna fix your problem, then they will attribute whatever they want to the fix of that problem. Many years ago, they did this brilliant study in the UK, which I guess they could do because people sat around waiting for their carotid endarterectomy, but they interviewed patients before carotid endarterectomy, and the only thing that operation does is prevent stroke. And they interviewed patients, and they were very good at describing the risks of the operation. And then when they asked patients what they were gonna get out of the operation, they said things like, my memory's gonna get better, and the ringing in my ear is gonna go away, and I'll be able to see better, and my headaches will be better. The problem with using this fix-it notion of what we are doing when we're doing surgery is that people will attribute whatever they want to the fix without understanding the real reasons for pursuing surgery. I suspect many of you have seen this video, but if you haven't seen the video, I'm not gonna play it. It is hilarious. So if you Google uh, orthopedics versus anesthesia, you will get this video, and the little blue bear with the blue stripy shirt is the orthopedic surgeon, and the red and white stripy shirt is the anesthesiologist. And the orthopedic surgeon says, I have a fracture, I need to fix it. And the anesthesiologist says, Where's the fracture? And the orthopedic surgeon says, it's in the emergency room. And it goes on and on and on and on. And the reason this is funny is because it smacks of truth. And it's not just because it's so easy to make fun of the orthopedic surgeons, it's because we all do this. We're working really hard to generate understanding of disease and treatment. And I worry that we have taken this way too seriously and misled patients and don't actually supply them with the kind of information they need. So the next step in my lab is to try and revise this preoperative conversation, but we're not there yet. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I wanna thank my amazing lab. This takes a ton of people to get this kind of work done, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. <laughs> ah, Giuliano. Hi, uh, Giuliano Testa from Baylor Dallas. The, the, this is a, a great thing. Uh, I have a, a, little pro, a couple of little problems. Uh, one is probably is the, uh, there is a lot of male mentality in surgery, and that's when I talk to my wife, she has a problem, and says, I'm gonna fix it. I don't want you to fix it, I want you to listen to me, which already is, is a problem in itself. The, what, what, after so many years of doing surgery, uh, and what I'm gonna ask you is, my impression is that no matter how simple you put it, no matter how many data you put on the table, no matter how long you explain, the patients very often don't wanna know many things. They really won't have the problem fixed. I mean, that, that's at least has been my experience as, as a surgeon. What would you propose would 
a different way of approaching this. Uh, you're not going to approach a problem of the toilet telling somebody it's going to cost you a lot of money and not telling whether you know, they really need the toilet fix, which is the, the, the bottom line of it. Yeah. So I'm just going to put it out there that Giuliano is a liver transplant surgeon and I am a vascular surgeon. Giuliano <laughs> fixes things in a way that um, I just rearranged the deck chairs on the Titanic. So, um, <laughs> so I actually think that there are things that we could say to patients that any patient could understand and that actually really they need to hear in order to figure out whether to have surgery. And so it's two things. One is talking about outcomes. Surgery does four things. You may help you live longer, feel better, make a diagnosis, or prevent disability. If if we don't mention one of those things in our preoperative conversation, we've really failed people. And the other thing that I think people can completely understand is this idea of a trade-off, right? That surgery might help you live longer, but there's a real trade-off. Even in this Whipple conversation, there is a real trade-off. And some of that trade-off is the risk that you might die, but another part of that trade-off is that you are never gonna eat the same again, and that you may have gastrointestinal distress in a way that makes it a little bit harder to live longer. And I think the problem is that we haven't distilled this conversation into this space of what are we trying to accomplish and what are you willing to trade off to get there? And I don't think talking about the risk benefits and alternatives is doing that for us, but I think we could have a different conversation that would get them there that everyone could understand that is not about fixing problems, but it is about achieving certain goals that people are willing to actually expend a fair amount of time physical distress in so, order to achieve. Uh, I don't know whether it's because I did the fellowship or because I've always been this way, but I think I approach the conversation with my, problem, with my patient exactly as you say. But So you think it's a widespread uh, common behavior from surgeons to ignore the, 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 the second part? So this is the best, no, so I think, think surgeons do the second part, but this is the best thing about showing up with data. I have 450 conversations that look like that. Okay. Bronner, uh, Chicago, uh, soon to be Kalamazoo. Um, Gretchen, this is amazing work. Um, I think you're really revolutionary, revolutionizing the whole concept of informed consent, taking it away from sort of the, the mechanical procedural aspect, which, which many people tend to fixate on, into what is really being offered and, and the real benefits and risks. Um, I think it, the, the data you presented of that, that turn that the surgeon take is, is incredible that somebody could talk so long without having any feedback from the patient and it, it, it really points to the fact that people really aren't having conversations, they're, they're having monologues um, and I think one of the basic things is people will need to learn is how to have a conversation in which there's turn taking and which there's a back and forth. Yeah, I mean, I think we're working really, I mean, so first of all, it's easy to pick on the surgeons, A, because I have data, and B, we probably bring it on ourselves a little bit, but I think other people who have audio recorded conversations between clinicians and patients very much see this sort of same notion of yes. this is your problem and this is what we're going to do to manage it. I think it happens in the ICU, for sure, it happens in oncology clinics, and I think that um, Oftentimes when I'm giving this talk, I say things like I blame the bioethicists, and I don't mean the people in this room. I mean sort of bioethics as a group that came up with this brilliant idea of informed consent in the 50s and 60s and then never did the empirical work to see how it was playing out in clinical practice in order to sort of revise and innovate and make it better. Because I do think that what we're doing is exactly what we've been taught to do, generate understanding of disease and treatment, and that I think is very flawed. I don't have a problem with the second part of the conversation. I just think that it's, um, you know, it's water under the bridge at that point. Well, it also brings up the question of, I mean, the, the people get very technical, and I think a lot of surgeons consider them are, are very, you know, they're good technicians and they know how to do the operation, but questions about, you know, what, what the values of the patient and do they, will they actually benefit and what ways will they benefit, those kinds of questions very often the surgeon don't even ask themselves. So I think it, to ask them to have that with the patient, I think, is, is 
yeah. difficult. So Dan, your point about what, what is the benefit of this operation is a really important one. And I'll often start an operation saying to the med student or the resident, why are we doing this operation? And they'll say something like, there's a blockage. It meets criteria. The ABI is low. And oftentimes I will have to ask that question three or four or five times to get to the point of make the patient feel better, help the patient live longer, prevent limb loss. You're spot on about that. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Fine. I'm a plastic surgeon at Northwestern, and I, I enjoyed your talk. Thanks. I think, though, I, I didn't hear you say specifically some ideas about people understanding probability, because when my patients, who are mostly women with breast cancer, are asking questions like, when, what's, when will I be recovered, or how will I do, I find that I have to try to tell them, well, I can tell you what's most likely or common, but I would have a hard time telling you exactly what's going to happen to you. I do this operation hundreds of times, and I will get a very diverse answer you know, from my patients about how they're recovering and how they're doing. And so the whole idea that someone wants to know, for instance, am I going to live? Will I die in this year? And you say, yeah, you're going to die this year. Oh, but I didn't. I lived for 10 more years, so you, you, were, you lied to me, versus you can live for 10 more years, but I died next month. Yeah, so, so I'm going to... Um, direct things. Yeah, so I mean, I think this issue of uncertainty and how we describe that with patients is really interesting and very important, and I think we shouldn't hide behind it as a reason not to do things. Um, I'm going to sound a little Elizabeth Warren-like here, but I have a plan for that. That is my surgeon-mediated intervention, um, and also equally challenging to study, but um, I have a different intervention. For that. Well, I talk to them about it. What I try to tell them is, you're going to ask me this question. I'm going to tell you what's most common, and I'm going to try to tell you what the ranges are. Yeah, so I'm going to put a plug in for my other intervention. It's called best case, worst case. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>